Hi, I want to thank everyone for coming today to our Everyday Math presentation. My name is Michelle Bowditch. I am the Early Childhood Teacher Specialist at Halls Crossroads Elementary. And I just wanted to bring you some tips and tricks, things that you can do to introduce your students, um, your children, young children, to the concept of math and really have different ways to touch it every day to enable your child to have more school success when they do enter preschool or kindergarten. So just by way of introduction, um, my background is and always has been early childhood. I was a kindergarten teacher in Harford County Public Schools for eight years and then two years ago transitioned into an early childhood teacher specialist role working with the birth to five community as well as teachers in the early childhood and primary grades. So thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, you'll see my everyday math presentation is there. Hopefully um, we will go through this together and you'll learn some new information that you can use when working with your children at home. So here's our agenda. We've already gone through the introduction. So we're going to talk about why it's important for children to engage in math activities every day. We'll talk about what is the play-based benefit, hands-on, what is play-based hands-on learning and what is the benefit for your child and what can you do to engage your child in math activities at home. So let's jump right into it. Why is math important? Uh, the studies show that a child's math skills at kindergarten entry are a better predictor of future academic success than reading skills, social skills, or the ability to focus. That's a big statement. And we can give our children a head start by helping them get comfortable with math concepts like measuring and counting at home. So we'll go over several of those suggestions today and different activities that you can use. So I'm going to give you a minute to go ahead and read this little quote. It's about children learning through play. So I think this is something that we all know as parents and caregivers that children really do enjoy play. They don't want to sit and do another worksheet. Um, but the research is there and supports it that that is actually a very meaningful way for children to learn. So this whole presentation is about ways to incorporate math skills into your child's everyday play. So I'm going to share, stop sharing my uh, screen for just a minute and then reshare with the video. Um, so it just talks a little bit more about the value of hands on learning. This up here, and we'll reshare. You know, when I was a kid, my dad um, drove a, a five hundred dollar bread truck into our driveway, and I thought we were going into the bread business. And he said, "No, this is our camper." I said, I can read it. It says Marita Bread and Rolls on the side of the truck. And then when the tunnel, we built bunk beds, put down, we made a sofa. We found the propane tank to a cold stove. We rewired the entire truck. Over that time, I learned how to be an engineer. And I was in middle school. So experiential learning. It wasn't until we painted the side of the truck that I realized we're going to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina on vacation in this recreational vehicle. So experiential learning, whether it comes from home, school, wherever you get it, Boys and Girls Club, but we have to give kids meaningful things to do with their hands and give them problems that can help you know, solve problems in the community or in the world and not just do make work stuff. And I think when we, when we let them build and create and, it, and, it, and it's meaningful and it helps them solve a problem, that gets them thinking about how they can be changing it for themselves and how they can be scientists and engineers because that's what they're doing and they're thinking creatively and they're solving problems. And that's what we do as, as engineers and scientists. And so get them, get them early building and creating uh, things that are meaningful. Like I told the bread truck to you know, save the day for us. And we'd have to spend $24,000 on a Winnebago when we have a $500 bread truck that serves the same purpose, getting the family in the cheapest way possible to a destination so that the family can explore. The intellectual side of learning and the physical side of learning, how are they connected and where does that interplay? And I think Lego has done a really great job of teaching kids to play. 
play with bigger Duplo blocks or the bigger blocks where they're trying to move them from one side of the body to the other side. Because if you split the brain as you're going across the brain, you are now making this physical space connection with both sides of your brain. And and their, their play is intentional to have kids do that at a very early age. And so understanding how my body works, how I turn and twist and jump when I'm catching a pass, has the same effect as me working hand controllers on the International Space Station, moving the $2 billion Columbus Laboratory out of the payload of the shuttle and attaching it to the space station. I have to know how to position my body in zero gravity where I'm not you know, floating off and I'm going to put in the wrong you know, hand controller motion that's going to slap the thing on the side of the space station and kill the project and maybe kill us. So body, mind, spatial reasoning, body spatial reasoning are all connected to solving problems. And, you know, you have these foot straps to put your feet in to keep you from, you know, translating around, but still you have to react off the hand controllers just like you do off the, off the foot straps. And I think, you know, understanding your body in space as well as on the ground helps you do these technical things that are, that are challenging with your body. All right. So I think Mr. Melvin does a much better job describing um, the connection between um, hands-on learning and the brain than I would do. So I wanted to, to hear it straight from him. Um, so we'll move on to our next slide here. So the power of hands-on learning, we all know that when we are um, listening to something and someone's telling us how to do something, that's great. Uh, but a lot of times we need that hands-on experience. We need to be able to do it ourselves in order to really understand and figure out how we're supposed to be doing it, what works and what doesn't. And the research has proven that students that are taught using hands-on teaching methods, methods with manipulatives outperform those who do not. So it is true for many subjects that most documented, but most documented in mathematics, um, and that mathematics, that early acquisition of skills in mathematics is really an important predictor of later achievement, not just in math, but in all the other subjects as well. So we want to give our students the best possible chance they can have starting out. And that's why we want to use hands-on activities. So everything we'll talk about today kind of falls within that vein. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the five math content standards. Uh, really all students are focused on learning five different strands or different content sections of math. So you have numbers and operations, algebra, geometry, measurement, data analysis, and probability. And we'll talk about some skills in all of those areas today that you can do. It sounds kind of strange to think about talking about algebra with a preschooler, but you'll see how those skills, the really foundational building blocks of algebra and those kinds of skills really do build in the early years. Numbers and operations. This is our biggest section, it's the biggest chunk. There's lots to do, and that's really where we start with kids. So we have lots of different activities. I'll go through them quickly, uh, but they're up there for you. You can always take a picture of it um, and have it save it for later. But you can form numbers. You can use really anything. You can do numbers with your body, Play-Doh, wiki sticks, anything, spaghetti. You can use just about anything to make numbers. So make it fun for the kiddos. You can write numbers in the sand. You can use shaving cream, finger paint. Some people use pudding, put it on their high school or their little um, high chair tray. So that's always fun or on the table as long as it's a wipeable table. Um, you can make gel bags, put a little bit of food coloring and some clear aloe vera gel in a Ziploc bag, secure it with some packing tape or something that they cannot open. Um, and then let the students really write on the outside of the gel bag, write the number, and then they can um, smear it together and then write the next number. It's a really tactile way, um, exciting way for kids to write their numbers, but it's not paper pencil. You can do feely numbers where you have children glue a certain number of objects onto a large number. You can do body writing where you would have them write a number on your back or you can take turns, you write a number on their back and they try to guess what number you're writing um, and vice versa. One of my favorite activities is disappearing numbers. You use a paintbrush and some water, give them a little bucket of water and a paintbrush, go outside on a nice warm day, and they can write the numbers on the sidewalk with water um, and their paintbrush, and then they disappear and they can write them again. You can ask them to write them in order. You can ask 
them to write them backwards. Um, from you can go from one to 10 or 10 to one, whatever you'd like. So that's a really fun one. Kids really enjoy that. You can go on a number walk or a number drive, uh, walk around your neighborhood, look for numbers, walk, uh, drive around in your car when you're out running errands, look for numbers. You can do this in order. So the kids have to find the numbers in order to make it more challenging and to understand the sequencing of numbers that they go in a specific order. Uh, you can play number bingo. There's lots of online templates for that, but you can also just do something really simple. Draw a bingo board yourself and add the numbers that your child's practicing. You can cut numbers from newspapers and magazines. This is a great one to take along if you're going to be um, waiting in a doctor's office or you have some place you need to go where they might be sitting for a while. You can bring a magazine or a newspaper and ask them to hunt for numbers. You can, if you have the ability to bring along some scissors and a glue stick, you can have them make a little number collage on the piece of paper. That's always a fun one. Number toss. You say a number and you toss a beanbag onto that number. So if you're outside, you can write the numbers on a grid on your driveway or on the sidewalk and have them toss it, say number three, and try to hit the number three with their beanbag land on number three. Um, inside, you can do the same thing. You can use pieces of paper with numbers on it or um, paper plates with the numbers written on it and have try to have them toss it, say the number they wanna land on and toss it to that plate. Counting bags, you can have each child has a counting mat, just literally a piece of paper or some sort of mat. Um, you can have a deck of cards, take all the picture cards out, just use the number cards and have them build that number. So flip over the number four and have them build the number four. You can use Cheerios, raisins, beans, buttons, whatever you've got handy as little counters because you're really want reinforcing that. I say one number, I add one object, that one-to-one -one correspondence. More things on numbers and operations, you can do use that same deck of cards, get some clothespins, they're really inexpensive at the dollar store, um, and have them clip the correct number of uh, clothespins onto the card. For example, if they flip over the number six, they need to clip on six clothespins. You can make a number book. Each page in the book is a different number, and then you can add stamps or stickers for that. This is a really fun and engaging one, especially if they have a favorite character, minions or Paw Patrol or whatever. Um, they can make the number one page has one Paw Patrol sticker. The number two page has two Paw Patrol stickers, that kind of thing. Um, identifying numbers that come before, in between, after. You can create a walking number line. You can do this outside with sidewalk chalk, write the numbers in a line, have them find a number, hop to a number, and then try to get them to identify the number that comes before and after. So you could ask them to stand on the number seven and then hop on the number that comes before seven and the number that comes after seven and ask them to say that number. Um, you can also do early addition with that as well. Have them hop two or hop back one and really start to um, understand the concept of adding and subtracting on a number line. And this last picture is an example of having a student write the number with white chalk. They can do it on a black piece of paper. You write it with white chalk and then you poke around the outline, trace around the outline of the number with a toothpick and hold it up to the light and you'll see the outline of the number, which is a fun one for kiddos. These are some number writing poems. Um, these are two different examples. You can certainly, if you Google number writing poems, you'll come up with lots of different examples. Um, and what we do is we encourage you to say the number, the poem as you're writing the number to reinforce that um, skill. So for number two, go right around and make a line across the ground, um, go right around. And what will it be? Go around again to make a three. So you'll say that poem as you are writing the number. And it helps to use activate different parts of the brain to remember and reinforce how to write the number as well as how to identify it. So we talk about algebra with little ones. I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but um, algebra is all about patterns, relationships, and functions of numbers. So in grades pre-K to two, these are some skills that really build that algebraic thinking. So sorting, classifying, and ordering objects by size, number, and other properties recognizing and describing and extending patterns. So when we talk with little kiddos, it can be as easy as, you know, um, bicycle, car, bicycle, car, bicycle, car, what would come next? And see if they can recognize the pattern or building a simple pattern with shapes or colors. 
and then asking them to understand what, how they could repeat that pattern, what would come next in that pattern. And again, when we talk about sorting and classifying, we can sort objects in many, many different ways. And we have on the screen just a few ways to sort objects. Um, you can sort, one of the favorite ones that kiddos always like to do is sort their food. So you can sort M&Ms, you can sort fruit snacks, you can sort fruit loops, you can sort just about a lot of different types of food. Um, you can sort their toys by size, shape, and color. Um, so these are just some different activities of ways that you can sort. You can use muffin tins or um, the egg cartons to sort objects in. Those are a really good way. They're also good for creating 10 frames. And these are more examples of patterns, different ways that you can use patterns. So there's the ice cube tray again, and this is the way you're built, you know, creating, extending, and building that pattern. So they just have pom-poms and an ice cube tray from the dollar store, and they're creating, identifying, and copying that pattern. Um, you can use their toys, you can use Legos, you can use cubes. You can do patterns with movements of your body. You can do um, jumping jack and hop in the air, jumping jack, hop in the air, jumping jack, hop in the air, that kind of thing, and have them start to help you create patterns that they can practice. Um, using stamping a pattern with bingo markers or different objects, little beads, little counters, lots of different ways. And those tangrams, the pattern block animals, those are really popular too. You can buy those. Um, there's lots of different versions online. You can play even online games. There's some iPad apps that have those pattern block animals that really help with your spatial, your child's spatial ability to create and see those shapes and patterns. Another uh, standard content standard for math is data analysis um, and probability. So we're looking at graphing in the younger grades. That's what this really looks like. So not only sorting and classifying objects, but then turning around and graphing them as well. So you'll see examples there of graphing your goldfish. Uh, there's an example of the students are graphing their Halloween candy. They've sorted them and then they're going to compare them, graph them and compare them. And you want to talk about which has more, which has less. Um, and then lastly, the last little picture is of uh, toys. They graph their land, sky, and water toys. And you can do really sorting with everything, shoes, types of clothing, um, hair color, eye color, different things, color foods. So you can graph your apples. Um, so lots of, lots of possibilities there for helping students interpret take sets of objects, count them, sort them, and interpret them, answer questions based on that. Another strand is geometry. We move into geometry, we start talking about shapes. Um, so we want students to start identifying and describing shapes. They can identify the number of corners, the number of sides. They can trace shapes using stencils. You can have them open up your plastic drawer where all your plastic um, storage containers are, and they can trace the lids circles, squares, rectangles, lots of different options there. You can form shapes using sand, Play-Doh, yarn, uh, rubber bands, silly string, whatever you've got on hand. You can go for shape walks in the neighborhood, just like you can do number walks, you can do shape walks in your neighborhood or store. You can start to look for three-dimensional objects um, in your recycling bin. Look for different things like Kleenex containers, um, the paper towel roll, those are all examples of cylinders, co cubes, cones. Um, use them to build something and then ask the kids to name their creation. So give them a bunch of pieces from clean recycling pieces, have them make something and then identify the name of the shape as they're building it. Um, you can play I have who has. Um, so I have a circle who has a triangle and give them little cards with those shapes on it. So they begin to identify and name those shapes. You can put shapes into a box, a little shoe box, put a hole in the top and have them reach in without peeking, see if they can feel around and identify the shape just by touch. Um, you can do different things like moving on shapes, tape out shapes on the floor um, and have them move to different shapes, move to the triangle, move to the circle, uh, move to the square. Uh, when you're making their food, talk about shapes, cutting those sandwiches into different shapes is really a fun thing to do. Um, and it's another way to talk about, um, I want my sh sandwich in the shape of a circle. I want my sandwich in the shape of a square. I want this, my sandwich in the shape of a triangle. 
and you can build shape collages, much the same as number collages. You can do the same thing with shapes using magazines and pictures cut out. And there's also shapes poems that you can download. You can find them. I have one resource there, www.wecanteach or canteach.com. Um, but again, same concept, you would say the poem as you make the shape in the air. So I'm Tommy Triangle, look at me, count my sides, and you would have them draw the shape as they say the poem. Measurements, these are just some really quick ways that you can talk about different measurements. So using those comparison words such as big and little, few or lots when talking with children. Um, baking is another great way to incorporate measurement into your um, everyday discussions with students and your young children, um, talking about measurements and how you have to measure and teaching them how to measure while you bake. You can do outdoor size hunt, um, look for things and use the comparisons in your shape hunt so you can look for things that are smaller than a fingernail or bigger than your hand um, and talk about the size difference and why it might be different for one person versus another, right? Something that's bigger than your and their hand might not be bigger than your hand. And why is that? Um, you can trace the hands of everyone in your family and compare. That's a fun activity to do. We usually put them on the refrigerator so everyone can see them. And then other things just to reinforce the concept of time, singing songs about days of the week, months of the year, seasons. I'm sure you've heard some before, but if not, YouTube is a great resource for that. They have all sorts of songs about days of the week, um, seasons, months. Um, months of the year. So those are fun little activities. You can play them in the car, you can play them on the go, wherever you are. Um, and then giving students different containers of different sizes when they're in the bathtub um, or in the sandbox, ask them which one holds more, which one holds less, ask them how they know, ask them to try to explain that for you, maybe because you can fit, you know, the contents of one into another one. That's how I know this one's smaller, those kinds of things to help reinforce that mathematical thinking. And then literature, we always like to bring in the books. So these are different, some different examples of how you can make those connections when you're reading. Um, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish for sorting, talking about putting um, objects into different categories. Counting, if you give a mouse a cookie, talking about how do you can use objects for manipulatives like um, animal crackers or cookies. Very Hungry Caterpillar talks a lot about time. It talks about the days of the week. Um, as the caterpillar goes through his day and how many objects he eats on each day. Um, addition and subtraction, this presentation mentions the M&M's counting book. There's also a Cheerios counting book. Um, and the Cheerios one has little spaces for you to put the Cheerios in. So it asks you to make a set of four or a set of five and they have to put those, place the Cheerios on that page as they go. Um, and there's eating fractions, another um, similar to, you know, cutting your sandwich into pieces or pieces of pizza. Talk about the whole pizza and how many pieces it has all together. And then talk about what if you only had half, what if you only had a quarter, that kind of thing. So before we, I let you go, we just want to let you know that we do have a lot of these resources on our HCPS Early Childhood Education website. Um, so if you go to the Hartford County Public Schools website and then you click on early childhood education, you'll find links to family and community support, mental and physical health, and also the rest of the education resources that we have available to you. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate your support. You are your child's first teacher. So we are excited to help support you in any way we can. Thank you.